this week's team is Spain. España. España. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what a team to pick, man, because yeah. situationally, this team has so much depth. This team is completely different from what existed in 2018. Stupid. And this team is shaping up to be a wild card in this World Cup. Yeah. They could be a complete and utter title contender, or they could be a round of 16 quarterfinal exit. Yeah. So we're going to dive deep into the landscape of this squad and just kind of what we predict will happen in the World Cup. But to start, where are you at with the Spanish national team? My, my immediate thoughts is actually exactly what you just said. Maybe I go one step further. For me, when I see the Spanish national team, when I see these 23, 25, whatever, 30 players that Luis Enrique has called up in these last 12 months, I see a dark horse team here at the 2022 FIFA World Cup. And again, it kind of goes back to that depth point of view that you were talking about. But ultimately, I think that's going to define whether they actually fulfill that dark horse narrative or not. My biggest takeaway from watching the games that I saw this weekend in La Liga, my biggest takeaway that I saw from doing the research that I usually do in anticipation for these games is that Luis Enrique has a conundrum, man. Who the hell does he play? Who are going to be the 11 players out on that pitch that actually fulfill that narrative of being a dark horse? Because they can. Yep. If Luis Enrique finds the perfect 11, if he puts the right players in the right positions to succeed, the Spanish team yep. can go all yep. the way. They can. But that's the thing. It's going to be completely down to the coach. And that's what's so interesting about the situation, yes, man, because sir. I don't think there's any other coach out of the 32 teams at this World Cup that has as many decisions to make as yeah, Luis Enrique. It's, it's overwhelming, bro. It's overwhelming. It's, over, it's like trying to find the the combination to a lock. Yes. There's so many different options at hand. To dive into that, I'm gonna th I want to mention some of the players that Luis Enrique has at his, at his disposal just so people can get an idea yeah. of the unreal depth that is uh, at the helm for this Spanish team. Defensively, here's a few names. Aspilicueta, yeah. Jordi Alba, Carvajal, Cucurella, who hasn't That's played, but right. an option there. Laporte, uh, Eric Garcia, Gerard Piqué, um, Pau Torres, yes. Sergio Ramos, and then goalkeepers, Simon, who started for, for most of the Spanish national, national squad games, De Gea, and then two potential nominees with uh, David Raya from Brentford and uh, Sanchez, the Brighton, Brighton goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. Defensively, have I missed any names? Not really, but I'm glad we started here because I do want to go back to front. So I want to start yeah. in between the sticks. Let's do it. Because recently, in pretty much every game, Enrique's gone with Simon. Yeah. He's chosen the 25-year-old from Athletic Bilbao to be his number one keeper. And it makes sense. United had a, you know, what a lot of people called one of their worst seasons last year, right? Even though it wasn't truly, truly that bad. And De Gea was a little but, exposed. Yeah, but it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, De Gea was a little exposed. And I think Enrique really saw that. He envisioned that. And he said, all right, I'm, I'm going to go with Simon. Simon, obviously, coming through the ranks of Atletico, have produced so many good keepers. And he's just another one that they yeah. produced. And over, I, I would say, over Ryan Sanchez, I think Simon has that mm -hmm. job. But what gets really interesting here is that, let's say United just keep riding this wave of wins, man. What if, what if Ten Hag figured it out right now and they don't stop losing or they don't stop, at least they, they remain like heavily undefeated yeah. for long stretches of times yeah. going into this World Cup and let's say De Gea really doesn't concede. Who do you pick? Yeah. No, that, seriously. That gets really That really gets tough. really tricky because, yes, Simone has gotten the call up a lot recently, especially in these last 12 months. But when you think about a player who has played in probably the bigger games, when you think about a player who has reached a higher peak, it is David De Gea. It is. De Gea offers more experience. He started in the 2018 World Cup. And like you said, I agree. I think he has a bigger, uh, a bigger peak than Simon. He's capable of some amazing saves. Saves that oftentimes can control the outcomes of games. You remember seeing yeah. De Gea get hot, bro? He, when, it, when De Gea yeah. gets hot on his saves, bro, yeah. he, makes, he makes some incredible jaw-dropping saves at he times. He does. If he, he does. gets into that mode. But Simone is secure. He he's is. reliable, and he's a, no, he's a safe option, I feel like. Based off of what I've seen and how Luis Enrique has approached um, this Spanish national team in terms of selections, I think he's going to go Simone, man. Yeah. Yeah. Solely because, right. Solely because he sees the talent. 
He knows he's secure mm-hmm. and he just, he, he values that. Yeah. Right. Is, that's what you're saying. I, I like, see it. There's yeah. like less drama too with like yeah. Simon. Yeah. Oh, dude, that is true because for De Gea to come into this national team, he's coming in as the number one Spanish keeper who's been the number one Spanish keeper mm-hmm. globally for a long time. So he kind of brings that, not necessarily ego, but that, that type of energy. Mm-hmm. A guy from Manchester United mm-hmm. is now going to be the starting goalkeeper for Spain, which is, which is completely different by choosing Simon in these last 12 months. It's completely mm-hmm. different. So you're, yeah, you're def- you definitely make a good point. Yeah, but I, I do think there's going to be some sort of pressure on Simon if he does end up starting because I think the footballing world expects the hair yeah. to start. Yeah. I, think, I think that's what they expect. So if Luis Enrique makes a bold decision to start Simon, there's going to be pressure on him and his first World Cup appearance to, to you know, provide stability back there. Yeah. And will he be able to do that? Time will tell. Exactly. So that, there's already an interesting decision to make. <laughs> exactly. At the at, fucking, and the, the one position. There's only one, the one position. position. That should be the easiest, It man. should be the easiest one, bro. <sighs> so if we move just up, just yeah. right in front of the keeper, the center back position, this this just gets even hairier, yeah, it man. Yeah, insane. Because you have, again, let's just list them out. True players who could actually start at the World Cup yep. for Luis Enrique. Yep. You have Cesar Espilicueta, yep. Aime Eric Laporte, Eric Garcia, Pau Torres, and recently... Recently, Luis Enrique has been playing and starting Inigo Martinez, mm-hmm. the athletic Bilbao center defender. So <laughs> that's five, five starting center backs that, they could, that uh, Luis Enrique can choose from. And we still haven't even mentioned Sergio Ramos. Or, P- or Pique. Or Pique. And that's, that's where it gets really interesting is because it kind of makes sense. Ramos hasn't been called up for over a year now. But it's because he's been riddled he's, with yeah, injuries. He was injured this past season. Truly, yeah. truly injured last year to where he, was, he wasn't playing because he couldn't. And so Enrique couldn't really pick him. He had no choice to. But it kind of reminds me of the De Gea situation in the sense that if he does pick Ramos, he'll be picking a guy who has led Spain to glory long before. A true veteran in that sense. Mm-hmm. And how many times have we seen international coaches have the option to choose a veteran and not choose them solely because they think it's better for the vibe of the squad solely because they think it's just better for the squad as a unit. Right. We don't, you, you, it, Chicharito. Yeah. <laughs> you, you make a statement by not picking that veteran. You basically yeah. say, look, we don't need to rely on the players of the past. We are who we are today and we can yeah. win. It sets a precedent. It sets a precedent. precedence. Yeah. Exactly. So even though Ramos has gotten off to a really good start with PSG really this good, year, man. I actually would not be surprised if Enrique doesn't call him up. But that's the thing, though. I wouldn't be surprised, but I would criticize him. I would criticize him. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. bro. Because Ramos looks good, man. Yeah. He looks really good. You can use that IQ, man. Anybody would use that IQ if you had that at your disposal. Oh, man, and, and for Enrique not to choose it? Yeah. Yeah. And if you could, if you ranked all the players at the World Cup with the most experience, Ramos is in like that top 3%. Yeah. Like if you just ranked it off of all the players at the World Cup, he is at the very, very top. Yeah, he's right underneath like, Messi and Ronaldo. Yeah, like he's that's right, it. It's <laughs> Messi, Ronaldo, yeah. Ramos. This would be like his fourth World Cup, I think, at this point. Yeah. So like I would criticize him. If Ramos continues his form, I'm criticizing that. Absolutely. I think he has, I think he has to start if, if he's at that level. And that's where it gets really crazy because any of those players alongside Ramos – could start and be very, very effective. What's really interesting about Enrique's options that he has is they're all pretty much the same caliber yeah. of defender, but they each have their own attributes. If you need a guy who's like a dog who will fight, kind of give you a barbarian type of attitude, you pick Inigo Martinez. But if you want a guy who showed for you up in the Euros, had a really good season that year with Villarreal, you know you you know you have that in Pau Torres, yeah. but then you still have Chelsea legend Cesar Espilicueta to mm-hmm. choose from too. Amerik Laporte, obviously a go-to guy for Pep when he's healthy at Manchester City. Who do you yeah. start, man? I think the one player that you don't start is is Garcia. Yeah, probably Garcia, who yeah. has started a few games for Spain in the past year. So yeah. I, I think that's a player that we won't see at the World Cup. Yeah. Personally, I don't think he I don't think he needs to be anywhere near that starting lineup. Yeah, uh, and, but you're right. Yeah, yeah the, the proposition at hand is insanely tough. But you're right. There, there really is no true downgrade. It's matter exactly. what it's, mix <laughs> creates the the yes, strongest formula. It's preference at that point. It truly comes down to Enrique's preference and who he thinks can fit in better to better suit mm-hmm. the formula that he's trying to create. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and which because is it could crazy. be it could be like <laughs> Piqué and Ramos. It could right? be at center back, <laughs> or it could be or it could be Laporte and Torres. Yeah, it could. And, and I and I actually think that they both. Both sets of center backs would be quality 
yes. quality center back. So yes. that in itself is such a mind game. It's such a headache for yes. Luis Enrique to figure out. I think he's one of the coaches whose starting lineups from this past year is going to look the most different in comparison to what he actually starts at the World Cup, man. Yep. So ultimately, in those two spots, who do you have? Who would you go with? God. I think I, I'm going to go ahead and say he's not going to pick Ramos. I really don't think he is. I feel like Enrique has his preferences. And right now, Ramos is not that preference. I think he's going to go with Aspilicueta. And to pair with him, he's either going to choose, oddly enough, Inigo Martinez or Pau Torres. Now, Laporte, man. I feel like he started Laporte a lot. Yeah, he, I feel like that's almost more secure, in my, in my opinion. Possibly, but... Dude, he's also played Martinez a lot mm-hmm. in these last, like, what, six games? A lot. Which is interesting. It's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. So it's so hard to pick what Enrique is actually going yeah. to do. If I had to pick, I would pick Aspilicueta and... At I, center back? Yeah, at center back. Okay. Well, because he, he plays that role for Chelsea. Yeah. Aspilicueta can play out wide, and that's the yeah. thing. Enrique, if he wants to have a defensive fullback, he can. Mm-hmm. But Espilicueta, especially in these last few years with Chelsea, has been a center back. And I think that's where he plays best. I, I ultimately think that a pairing of Laporte and Ramos is the best. I know that we won't see it, though. Right. I know, I, I like, I'm almost 100% sure we won't see that. But I'm going full-on quality here. Mm. I think Ramos brings in... Uh, so much experience, but also a combination of, of quality. And I think he's better off being paired with someone like, like, like Laporte instead of Pique because Pique has shown somewhat inconsistencies this season. He's been benched at times, yeah. and he hasn't gotten the amount of minutes that he usually gets, but it's mainly because of his age. I That's think he's thing. declined a little bit. Pique might not even be called up yeah. at this point, especially yeah. if he goes with those other four players ahead of mm-hmm. him. Yeah, and so for me, uh, a Ramos-Laporte combination would be incredible. You got a Man City and PSG center back yeah. just teaming up. Like, I don't that, see how that's that, a bad decision. That there. does sound nice, um, actually. <laughs> but realistically, I see Laporte, and I'm going to predict Torres. I yeah. think Pau Torres, yeah. Because yeah. Pau Torres is, is also a stud, man. He's phenomenal. He's a, he's a very, he's very good yeah. one-on-one defender. Yeah. And that's the thing. It, if he prefers that, he chooses Torres. It just yeah, de- it, de- de- yeah. it depends on what yeah. he prefers, man. Yeah. Um, but one position I think in that back line that probably is secure if he's healthy, right back, Dani Carvajal. Yes. I think that's yeah, secure if he's healthy, which I hope he is because that'll only help Spain's chances yeah. of being that dark horse. I wonder how... I wonder if Enrique is low-key wishing for some injuries to make his job easier, bro. <laughs> Jesus fucking Dude, ima- you know, imagine, bro. Like, he's like, please, please make my make job easier. somewhat easier, yeah. man. Yeah, you're right. No, Carvajal, I think, still has so much quality to give. Mm-hmm. He's shown it time and time again, week in, week out. Yeah. He's very much secured that spot, in my opinion. Um, but on the other side, you have interesting options. Uh, Jordi Alba Jordi would Alba. be the somewhat safe and experienced move to go with it's experience but he's around 33 years old now yeah he's a, little, he's a bit of a different he's getting player up there. Yeah. he's getting up there but then again you also have a really interesting wild card with cucurella who's been on an insane rise the yeah. past two seasons now, yes and has found himself a basically starting position at chelsea uh do you consider cucurella who hasn't even played in any of spain's games i believe he hasn't he yeah. has not played and that's what worries me is I think we're going to see what type of coach Enrique is yeah. when he picks his squad. Is he a guy that just kind of sticks with what he knows? Or does he take a risk and pick a guy he's never called up before? And Mark Cucurella. That's such a risk. Dude, it's he's such a never... risk. He's never, he's never dealt with him. And to do it now, it's tough. But I think it'd be the right decision. I think Cucurella is on that form right now. He's firing on all cylinders. He's the typical Spanish technical player. He would fit in like a glove. That's That's the thing. That's kind of selling point is that he's so able to just fit into any squad. Exactly. Alpha game one with Chelsea, he looks so comfortable, man. Like I think he is that type of player. So if there's a player to take a risk on, I wouldn't mind that being Cucurella, bro. Especially over a, a. a Jordi Alba, who's just a little bit less un- uninspired nowadays, yeah. I feel like. He, had, he used to have a more of a drive to him. Yeah. And Cucurella is everything is is all drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah, he has guess, one oh, gear, and it's just like, go. Yeah, He's just like, let's buddy, go. Man. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and then other yeah, alternatives yeah, that he options. could go with. Maybe Juan Bernat, the PSG mm-hmm. fullback. Mm-hmm. He gets minutes at PSG. He's very good on the ball. But kind of like Alba, maybe not the most efficient offensively. Yeah. And so... If I had to pick who Enrique is probably going to go for, it's probably going to be Jordi Alba. Yeah. I'll be completely honest. Yeah. Although, if he picks Cucurella, man, I think I just think it'd be the better choice. 
And rounding up the whole back line, let's go over the predicted line. Mm. Not what we want, but the predicted line. Alba, left back. Alba. Who are we going to go with at center back position? I, th- I do think Aspilicueta is going to play. <sighs> he has to. So, he has to, bro. Aspilicueta doesn't not play when he gets called up for Spain. He's there for a That's reason. That's true. That's true. He's yeah. there for a reason. Yeah. I think for me, it's I don't know who he's going to play alongside. I have no idea. Laporte. <laughs> I'll go could, Laporte, I, yeah, and I'm down Laporte, for that. Laporte, and then uh, right back Carvajal yeah. with Simon at the back. I think That's so. We're for I, Spain I, right I now. think so. Okay. We move forward in the <laughs> hopes of finding somewhat uh, <laughs> stability. stability yeah. And we find everything but that. Yeah. Because Spain is one of the most stat countries in the midfield position. Bro. Spoiled. Spoiled, bro. Dude, the, the, the average technique of a Spanish player. Unreal, <laughs> dude. dude. What Unreal. are they teaching those kids? What man? the hell? What bro? are they doing? They're, they're drinking prime, bro. <laughs> those kids are drinking prime. <laughs> it's crazy. <sighs> man. You on, honestly, honestly, you could convince me if you made a case. You wrote down a thesis, and I read it, and you made a case that Luis Enrique needed to choose Iker Muniain, Oyan Sunset, and Alex Berenguer, all three Athletic Bilbao players to play the midfield. I'd be like. I, I could see it. Yeah. I could see it. Because they're that technically sound. Because they're that technically yeah. sound. I'd be like, yeah. maybe that's the key to unlocking maybe. the front three. Maybe. Maybe. And I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'm convinced. That's how deep the Spanish midfield could be. Yeah. If Enrique wants yeah. to kind of spoil himself. Yeah. Rodri. Mm. Coque. Yeah. Soler. Yeah. Pedri. Gavi. Busquets. Thiago. Dude. Llorente. Mm. Muñain. Yeah, yeah. Throw him in there. Um... Any other ones? Technically, Pablo Fornaz, maybe. Fornals, He's yeah. been getting kind of called up, but he hasn't really been playing, though. That's mm-hmm. the other thing. But, again, just very technical players that they, that they can call up. Yeah. I know that Enrique, not recently, but has called up Brian Diaz from AC Milan. If he keeps getting good form, maybe we see Brian Diaz, too. So, it's just interesting. It's, it it yeah. is interesting. One player that I think will start no matter what is Rodri. Over Busquets? I think Busquets is not going to play. I think Bu- Busi's time yeah, is yeah. uh, kind of like Pique. Yeah. And honestly, maybe even kind of like Ramos in a, in a sense. I think Busquets' time is done as a starting midfielder for Spain. Um, I think Rodri I think, yeah, too, is right? the yeah. defensive midfielder that's going to be in that pocket to play alongside two other creative mm-hmm. midfielders. I think Enrique kind of sees that too. In the last like four games in the Nations League, he's picked Rodri to be that anchor. And I mean the way he's playing at City, man. Yeah. How, I, how can yeah. you not? Yeah, play he hasn't him? done anything wrong at this point. Like, nah. He's done everything to earn that spot. Yeah. Um, right in his prime too. I think he does deserve it over Busquets, but it just it does surprise me to see being Busquets get picked over is pretty nuts, man. That pretty nuts, nuts considering how long he dominated that specific position God. for the Spanish national team. A decade. And what he generated in terms of trophies and accomplishments. But Rodri's next man up, I think and so. he deserves it. I personally have a very, very um, defined take on who should start alongside him on the left side. Okay. For me, I think Thiago has to have a starting position in this lineup if he is healthy. Because to me, I believe Thiago is a type of player when at full health is capable of being the best player on the pitch on any given day. Yeah. He can match up with anybody. He can bring in his Tekker style of football, yeah. and he can completely show out if he is healthy. Yeah, yeah. That's what he's capable of. That's his height. That's the selling point on Thiago is his God-given ability on the ball, mm-hmm. his ability to protect the ball, his ability to see lanes, to sling that ball out when needed, and do it in the most creative way po- ways possible. He can change a game. He can change he, From the game. midfield, he, he can, can change, change a game. game. I would compare him to a, a Kevin De Bruyne type of player in effect. Yeah. Um, and so for that, I am, I am uh, adamant that if Thiago is healthy, I don't care who started there before. <laughs> I don't care who has. Who, yeah, yeah. I don't care who uh, Enrique has promised is going to have that position. Right. I think Thiago has to start for the Spanish national team on the left mid side. Completely agree. If he's healthy, which I actually do have my concerns mm-hmm. about that, mm-hmm. but obviously that's not in anybody's control, unfortunately. Uh, if he is healthy, I think Thiago does have to start, and he would start alongside Rodri purely because of everything you just said, class, yeah. w- world-level skill, all that. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And then so that for me 
then brings an incredible debate into who comes into the right midfield position because we have like <laughs> 10 players lined up for one spot. Lined up for one fucking spot, man. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think I have my pick. Yeah, what, what do you have? I think I have Gavi, man. I, I really do. So one of the games I caught this weekend was Barcelona against Cadiz. Yeah. And Gavi was everywhere. Truly a Barcelona product. And obviously Enrique being an ex-Barcelona coach, I think – I think likes that he yeah. sees that and he's like okay I, I like what this kid has to offer and he's already playing at such a high level let's bring him into this national team already and i think gavi obviously has the skill the ability to play right alongside rodri and tiago hopefully if he's healthy but also i think you would pair really well with him because gavi's offensive minded as hell sure he's not going to get that final assist or he's not going to be the goal scorer but he's going to be a part of every single yeah. build-up play he has the technique but another thing that i really like about gavi is that he's attracted to the ball man he almost needs to get a touch in it's crazy he occupies kind of that right side a lot for barcelona yeah. and you'll see him out on that side but if he doesn't get a touch over like the course of three four minutes He'll slowly go towards the ball. <laughs> like a magnet. Yeah he's, a ma yeah, he's magnetized to it, man. And he just gets his touch in. He gets involved. Yeah. And if anything, that can help isolate maybe the winger on the other side. You make a big switch, and then you have a one-on-one. -on -one. So I think Gavi's ability offensively is just its creative. It's almost kind of like an X-factor effect. And when you have ball passers and ball possessive players like Rodri and Thiago to kind of feed Gavi, oh, yeah. and then from there, Gavi can feed the front three. I oh, yeah, think that's bro, yeah. hella effective, man. I really do. And when you look at other players that maybe could play there, I know Coque and Carlos Soler okay. have been occupying that position a lot. But when I think about true, true creativity, even Soler, I think Gavi's better. I do think he's better, even though he's a lot, lot younger. But again, it'll be what it'll be what Enrique prefers because Coque has been playing a lot. He's yeah, been get, lot, he's yeah. been starting yeah. a lot alongside Rodri. And it'll be interesting because it'll just be completely down to preference once again. Does Enrique want to kind of expose that midfield a little bit, let Gavi do his thing where he just roams free? Or does he want a guy in Coque who <laughs> knows yeah, the central yeah. midfield position like no other? Either one is really good to have. It'll simply be what do you want? We go back to the formula case. Like what is he trying to what create? What is he trying to create? Um, I, would, I would like to see Gavi there. Yeah. I, I actually do think that in terms of what we are predicting he is trying to create, Gavi would be the best fit because you have so much security in having Rodri right yeah, behind you. Yeah, you do. You do. You have so much security. You do. Thiago is also very well defensively, I, I, I would argue. And so I think that there is a lot of there's – there's almost like a freedom that you can give to that right midfielder specifically – and to give it to a guy like Koke provides security, but it's almost like, do you need that at this point? All you right. do need a little bit more creativity. You kind of need a more attack-minded player, uh, a player that can get that final assist, who can <laughs> penetrate, who can yeah, get man. an amazing touch, can get out of tight spaces. Yeah. I, I do see Gavi having a prominent role on this team if Enrique instills his, his faith in them. Yeah. For me, what, it, what this question brings up, though, is, what do we see as Pedri's role? Do we see it as a midfield role or more of a wing role? Do you see him up front? That's what's crazy too because if, let's say, Thiago's not healthy, I think I would go with Pedri. And, but the, the problem is, is that that's so different stylistically. Yeah. That's yeah. so different. That's a completely different player. Um, but again, it is what kind of Barcelona are going with. When everybody's healthy, it, it seems like Xavi is using De Jong as the anchor, and then he really likes yeah. Gavi, and then it's usually Pedri if he's healthy. Yeah. Oddly enough, Pedri <laughs> does get injured a lot, un unfortunately. Mm -hmm. If he's healthy, I think Enrique probably would prefer Pedri to be in that midfield, simply because I think you just want more out-and-out -out wingers or more offensive, direct-minded players to be in that front three, whereas Pedri really is a creative he, he yeah. he's more of a creative yeah. midfielder rather than than yeah. any, anything else. But man, that's a lot of faith to instill into these less than it's twenty crazy, year old dude. kids, bro. It's crazy. A World Cup appearance to to have two of your three midfielders be under twenty years old that's in crazy. a World Cup is a lot, a lot, man. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Um, and I know that we built up Gavi and Pedri to be these mentality monsters because I do think they are. But part of me is just like, man, like I don't know. They're still kids, man. Yeah. Like, ah. I think realistically, uh, let's say Thiago. a lot of pressure. If Thiago's injured, it'll most likely be Coque, Rodri, Gavi. And if if Pedri comes off the bench and has a hell of a game, maybe he changes it in the next game. Yeah. It'll be one of those. He's just going to have to feel this out. 
So we're kind of bringing it down to that midfield to, I guess, five players and Pedri, Coque, Rodri, Thiago, and Gabi. Gabi. Those five is kind of what he's going to end up fiddling with. It, for me, it has to be that yeah. simply because these guys are elite, man. Yeah, I think elite. from there, it's a, it's a bit of a drop off to the next guy like Soled so. or, yeah, it or is. Um, it is. Llorente maybe. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I do think those would be the top five to go to. So ultimately, you predicted who is going to be the starting three for Spain? If Thiago's healthy, Thiago, Rodri, Gavi. I agree. If he's not, it'll be Coke. I agree. And that's what I want, too. So, yeah. nice, to, nice to see that. Nice to see nice that. To a little bit more <laughs> yeah. certainty. In right, a little bit more certainty yeah. in the midfield. Yeah. Hopefully, man. <laughs> wow. Finally, we have the dramatic Spanish offense coming to the forefront now with players like Alvaro Morata, yeah. uh, Sarabia from PSG, De Tomas, Yermi Pino, Oyar Sabal, potentially. Marco Asensio, if you want. Dani Olmo. Ferran Torres. Yeah. Uh, Ansu Fati. Yeah. Gerard Moreno. Iago Aspas. Jeez. Once again, we find ourselves in the pickle. <laughs> ah. Nothing's changed. One thing that I realized in the planning of this uh, analysis is that I realized that like in, in, in ways that no other World Cup has ever experienced, I think this World Cup will be very, very different. First off, because yes, it is like in the winter time, so it's happening in the middle of basically football it's happening yeah. in the middle of the season for all these all these players um whereas usually we would have the world cup in and then about a month long break and then the world cup starts everyone starts off in the same page we now have a world cup happening where you can kind of gauge where a player or how a player is going to perform at the world cup because there's a bigger indication of what form they're going oh, to be oh in. yeah dude form is going to play a huge role yep in the selection of players and in the results of, of these teams at the World Cup. Yep. And so with that idea in mind, that theory of form coming into play, Enrique has to consider Iago Aspas. <laughs> Iago Aspas, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, because I know already, already, I'm already generating some, some, <laughs> some, some uh, flack. Iago Aspas has scored double-digit goals oh, yeah. in La Liga since the Obama administration. Yeah. He's been doing this for like well over seven fucking years. Yep. I understand. He's 35 years old now. He's old. Mm -hmm. He is an old man. He played in the 2018 World Cup, and honestly, he didn't have a good World Cup, but I would honestly bring that down to Spain's system not being well-suited to his style of play. No, that 2018 was weird. It was very weird Spanish really team. Really weird Spanish Overall, team. and not suited well for many players on that yeah. team, which is why they got knocked down the round of 16. Now we have an opportunity to have a Spanish striker up top that is capable of creating chances in the box, feeding teammates, but also just knowing when to finish, how to score that clinical goal, yeah. how to just uh, finish a team off in that sense. And I understand people are going to bring up the argument, you know, Iago Aspas is, is really old. He's really old <laughs> compared to most players, sure. but he's got five goals and one assist in five games in La Liga already. Oh, yeah. He is once again showing that he's on pace to go double digits and that he still has it in him. I'm watching this guy play, bro, week in, week out at Celta Vigo, yeah. and I don't see any reason to not consider him, honestly, at least for the opportunity to potentially be on the bench, man. It'd almost be something out of respect for what he's been able to achieve in La Liga and for the Spanish national team because, in general, I feel that he is an underrated player oh, in yeah. the Spanish realm of football. When you, when you talk about MVP, most valuable player, Iago, Iago Aspas is arguably one of the most valuable players in La Liga, for his club, Celta. Yeah, you're right. Without Iago Aspas, Celta Vigo will probably get relegated. Yeah. Man. The amount of goals that he's given to this club year in, year out is incredible. Kind of like Cristian Suani did for Girona for so many years. Um, so in that regard, I completely agree. And in, that, in, in the second regard, Iago Aspas, if there's one thing he's good at, it's finishing. He is a clinical finisher. When you compare him to the competition that he has in the Spanish, Spanish national team, I would say there's two guys maybe ahead of him, and that is Alvaro Morata and Gerard Moreno. The only thing I think that Morata and Moreno, especially Moreno, have over Aspas is the ability to link up with their teammates. And the thing is, it's not, it's not Aspas' fault mm -hmm. because it's not how Celta play. Celta are on a possession-based team. They're very direct. Honestly, their go-to directive on the pitch is get the ball to Aspas yeah. in advanced positions. Yeah. So that's how Aspas plays, and that's why he gets a lot of goals yeah, because they feed him in that, yes. in that manner. Like high usage. Like, yeah, 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 high usage, yeah. yeah. They, they really get a lot out of Aspas yeah. very efficiently. 
I think my only thing is is that Enrique doesn't play that way. Again, once again, an ex-Barcelona manager, he does like the possession side of football. Yeah, that's true. And Moreno and Morata, and I, again, I would say Moreno even more so, they play in systems that kind of value link-up play. They play in systems that value build-up. Maybe even if it's just as simple as like knocking it back backwards to a, a midfielder and then you make a run, mm-hmm. Aspas doesn't really do that because he doesn't have to. I'm not saying he can't do that because he absolutely can. He's very technically gifted. But as far as fitting into a system, I think Morata and Moreno probably fit into Enrique's system a little bit better. Although I would like to see Aspas make bench appearances. To, so I, in that regard, I actually do agree. If Spain need a goal. You you bring on yeah. Iago Aspas, yeah. and so absolutely, if you need a guy who just is really good at scoring, kind of like how when Andre Pierre Gignac played in the Euros for France in 2016, yeah, yeah. they solely used yeah. him when they needed a goal and there's 20 minutes left yeah. because Gignac's a really good goal scorer. Yeah. I think Aspas can play a very similar role. When Spain need just a goal, it'd be great to have Aspas come off the bench and what and. I would actually like to see that. I, I think the a bench position would be worthy of what he's been able. What I think so. Would be worthy of what he's provided, uh, but also be a smart move because, like you It'd said, if smart. you need that fucking goal, you go to him. You go to but him. yeah, I think the the starting position up front you think is between Morata and Gerard Moreno. I do think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for a while, I thought maybe Iglesias, Borja Iglesias could get in there, but now nah, I mean Aspas is miles Borge. ahead of, ahead of him. Um, but do you see Moreno being able to get in front of Morata? That's the thing. It, it really just seemed like Enrique likes Morata yeah, in that number nine position. Yeah. And maybe it's just, again, because Morata's maybe a little bit more physical. Maybe he's bigger, but he's also good with the link up play. Maybe he I, values that. Moreno's is like a little really weaker. Similar, man. Yeah, they, they are. Similar players. M- Moreno is a lot more silkier, though. But honestly, in some ways, to his downfall, to where he does get shrugged off the ball a yeah. lot. And he isn't the best of finishers, but what's weird is that Morata isn't either. And yeah. it, it completely comes down to form, in my opinion, when it comes to this. But I think Enrique just recently has been Morata, Morata, yeah, Morata, yeah, Morata. No so, so I think Morata is going to get the start, at, at least at the start of the tournament. Okay, yeah, I, I, I got to go with you on that too. I think Morata gets the start. Um, now the question is who joins him on the flanks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we now have players like Ansu Fati, who's returned from injury. Yes, getting a lot of um, a lot of a, 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 honestly a fan push. There's other options. There's other options with Ferran Torres as well being considered. Do you do you bring in Marco Asensio? Um, does De Tomas get a call up? Right. What what ends up being the the final move for Enrique to to just conclude this starting lineup? Yeah, for me, this position goes down to what you just said a while ago in the sense that this tournament really is going to show us players who are in form and players Mm -hmm. who aren't. Mm -hmm. I think a player out of form right now, Ferran Torres, man. He's not looking good right now with Barcelona. He really isn't. Torres has been getting a lot of rotation minutes, especially since Barcelona in the Champions League. So when Xavi needs to rest his starting wingers, he's starting Torres. But Torres is not looking good, man. Even just this past week, uh, he played in... He's just slightly off in He's everything. Off, His finishing dude. is just off. It's just slightly off. It goes a little bit over the bar, yep. a little too much to the side. And I feel like it's been like that ever since like his final days at Man City, bro. I haven't seen him score since the Trump administration. <laughs> if I keep going with that theme. <laughs> that it's thing. been a while, man. I think for... You no, know, absolutely. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't seen Torres play well since he was at Man City. Yeah. I'll be completely honest. His move to Barcelona has not worked out for him. Maybe it's the style of play. I don't know what it is, but Torres is out of form. I wouldn't pick him uh, at I, all. I will harp on him a little bit. I don't, I just, I've, never been, I've never seen it with Torres. Mm. I never really mm. have seen it. Yeah. So I don't know if he's just kind of being exposed a little bit for just not being the type of player that people thought he was. I, I still think he's, he's very good, but I don't know if he's Barca caliber at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But a player that I do think is, I think he's going to get in, is Ansu Fati. I think Ansu Fati gets in. I know that he has his injury issues as well, but I think his style of play will fit this sort of dynamic Spain possession based offense. He's a Barcelona player, like we pointed out as well. Yeah. And when he has gotten the opportunities to play for Spain, he's done really well. Yeah. I think that Ansu Fati, if if that position is open, I I think he gets slotted in. Yeah. I, I definitely definitely could see it. You know, what's it been interesting is that Enrique has really gone with Dani Olmo mm. a lot. Like yeah. surprising yeah. a surprising amount. 
And it's again, it maybe it comes down to the preference where he likes that an inverted winger who doesn't really hug that touchline, comes in a lot, gets active centrally, even from outside. Maybe he prefers that, but is Olmo in the best of form right now with Leipzig? I don't know. It'll again, I think it's just gonna yeah. come down to who is in form. And if Ansu Fati starts getting really good minutes, gets very involved with this Barcelona squad. Uh, in these coming months leading up to the World Cup, I would probably enjoy it more if Fatih started over Dani Olmo. But on the other side, I think there's only one player that's going to start wide right, and that's probably going to be Pablo Sarabia. Mm -hmm. I really do think so. He's pretty much cemented that position as the right winger for Luis Enrique as that starting position. And I honestly, I don't know who else is more solid. I'm not saying Sarabia is the go-to guy in that position, but... I think this kind of shows you that if Spain do have a weakness, it's probably their wingers. Probably. Yeah, um, I mean, I, last thing I want to mention is I, I could also see Pedri somehow getting into the winger position. Maybe. He's done that at Barca. Right, if he, uh, maybe low-key, kind of like how Dani Olmo plays as a winger. Yeah. Maybe he just goes with Pedri, who's probably low-key like a little bit was better. If healthy, then, and he doesn't you have push a him up. you push him up. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Yeah, but, but still, the, the problem remains that on that right-wing position, you really only have Pablo Sarabia, who gets bench minutes at yeah. PSG. Right. And for the rest of the quality on this squad, that's not good enough. That's the thing is that when Sarabia does play, I mean, he's good. He's, he, he doesn't do bad when he comes off the bench for PSG. And obviously, Galtier trusts him to constantly mm -hmm. play off the bench, mm -hmm. right? He knows that Sarabia is the next best player outside of Neymar and Messi and Mbappe. Mbappe. Yeah, yeah. That, that says something. It says something. And he does have faith in him when he does bring him on constantly. And so, again, you see it on the pitch. Sarabia does well. But you're right. To match the quality yeah. that Spain have in the midfield, is Sarabia that guy? Probably not. But is it all you have? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't might know. Be all at his disposal there, or maybe he yeah. inverts one of these guys. Like maybe exactly. He, get, he like, finds like you said, Fati to come on the right or something. Yeah. So finally, how do we predict the final starting three will be? Let's do that. I think it'll be Morata, Sarabia, and it, I think it'll depend on who's more informed, whether it's. Fati, Olmo, or Pedri. No Asensio? No, Asensio's not going to get any time, bro. He's not going to get any. Does I've, he get called up? I haven't seen Asensio play in four years. <laughs> <laughs> but does he get called up? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe simply because, again, if Spain do have a lack in depth, I would say it's in that top three. Yeah. I definitely would say that. But, yeah, I mean. Who, 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 I, I'm going. I think Pedri gets pushed up. I really yeah. do. I, yeah. I, I would, actually, I would be interested to see that. Left winger Pedri, uh, Morata up top. And then, um, I'll actually, I just don't see Sarabia getting that, get ultimately getting that that selection yeah. to start. I just I see him as a bench player for this team, bro. I'm going like Ansu Fati, dude. Seeing this final eleven for the first match day of Spain is going to be yeah. telling, yeah. man. Yeah, it's gonna tell me everything, everything I need bro. to know about what Luis Enrique was thinking. Leading up to this World yeah, Cup, bro. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. I'm actually so excited to see that team sheet, man. <laughs> as soon as they call out Spain's 11, I'm be like, where bro, the yeah, heck? Yeah, Who's the starting, hell? man? Yeah, bro, I'm be hyped an hour before the game yeah, starts. Bro. Because I'm just be waiting for that lineup. That's going to define the game for <laughs> it's me. It's going to define the game. Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's, it's just loaded, man. Okay, so now that we got the players all lined up and we predicted how Luis Enrique is going to line these players mm -hmm. out, we have Spain and Group B with Germany Costa Rica and Japan. Um, I think in general, most people expect Spain to get out of this group. For me personally, I actually have Germany topping the group and coming out in first with Spain coming in second. I've been saying this since our early predictions and yeah. I still stand by it. Okay. Okay. Um, you real quick, where do you, where are you at on who gets out in what position in that group? I, I think Germany are better. I do think they're better. They're, they're just slightly more along their developmental path than Spain are, but I'm still going to stick by it. I think Spain are a true dark horse of this tournament. All it's going to take is for Lu Luis Enrique to figure out that combination. Okay. I ultimately, when I make my final prediction for where I see Spain f panning out in this whole tournament. Yeah. We mentioned at the, at the beginning, Spain is a, a lock waiting to be unlocked. <laughs> yeah. Once Enrique, if he gets that combination right, he could be... He could be at the forefront of a of a of a 
a treasure, an act, an absolute jewel of a team yeah. could be at his hands if he gets it right. My thing is though, when I look at all the decisions that Luis Enrique has to make, it's overwhelming, bro. It is. It's overwhelming, and it's actually a bad thing. There's too many options to be made that I just don't see him making the right ones at the end of the day. I think it's almost like gambling. Like his odds are just <laughs> yeah, lower. Yeah, he's, he's rolling dice, yeah. it, picking it's, it's center backs. High risk, high reward. <laughs> like he, if he gets it right, he's gonna get it right. But if he doesn't, man, I predict we see a Spanish team that gets out in the quarterfinals. I have them finishing top eight. Maybe it's a close game. Maybe they almost pull it off. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I have Spain losing in the quarterfinals. Okay. Yeah, I think that's uh, actually that's really respectable. I think. Um, what I love about the group stage is that it is three whole games, and if there's a team that maybe needs all mm. three games to figure yeah. it out before going into the knockout rounds, it might be Spain, it's man. Absolutely Spain. And so if they if they get that first game and Enrique's like, yeah, this this ain't it. You know, I, I picked the wrong team. Uh, second game, he kind of tinkers a little bit. And by that third game, he's like, all right, I figured this out. And if they do enough to at least just get that top two in the group, I think Spain could be a really tricky team to face yeah, in the absolutely. knockout stage. Yeah. A super tricky team. And we actually saw how well they dazzled in this past Euros, man. Yeah. And honestly, they completely surprised me because I didn't really rate Spain going to the Euros based off of their 2018 performance in the World Cup. So if they can kind of replicate what they did at the Euros – but couple the fact that they're a little bit more experienced and Enrique has a slightly better idea who of who of what players he can pick. I think Spain can do the same thing. They can dazzle at this tournament, potentially beat anybody that they face. But ultimately, I actually do have them finishing probably quarters as well. Damn. Yeah. No, no semis. Semis is tough, man. Yeah. Semis that's top four. That really, really that tough. That's top man. four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but they could. I'm they not could. saying they can. I think they do have the ability to. They I do. Just, they do. I just think there's too many things for Luis Enrique to figure out, which is why I want to turn mm. to our our viewers and I want to ask yeah. you guys. This is a big one. I want to get a lot of involvement here. Who starts for the Spanish national team? What is that combination that ultimately leads them to victory? I need to know what you guys know because this is yeah, yeah this is like the Zodiac Killers jigsaw puzzle, man. Yeah. Like there, there's just so much to figure out here. It's a maze. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, guys, let us know. Let us know what you think. How far you think Spain will go? Are they a quarterfinal exit team? Are they a semifinal team? Or are they World Cup champions? Let us know now and. Uh, comment who you guys want us to do next as we head closer and closer to the world cup